Well, um, I wanted to start out with uh, hearing from some of you uh, about a subject I think I told you about last week. And it has to do with the use of the Psalms through the centuries uh, and even in our modern day in our worship, in our worship music. Um, so let me throw out a question that I forewarned you about a little bit. And that is, it's been my observation, I'm not sure if you've experienced, it's been my observation that worship tends to be a very emotional and personal thing. And when changes come about in worship in churches, you'll often have disagreements and controversies. Um, if you have not experienced that in churches, you're a very fortunate Christian because many churches have experienced battles and, and disagreements on this whole area of worship. So I'm posing to you a question today. Why has worship music and style of worship been such a controversial topic in American churches, let's say during the last 20 years or so, maybe even a little bit before that, uh, when, uh, when new styles of worship began to be used. Um, talk to me. What are some of your observations about worship? What are some things that you've maybe experienced? Have any of you experienced controversy in a church over this? Okay, so we've got a few of us that have gone through differences of view. It looks like the rest of you, if you're not raising your hand, Everything in that area is pretty well agreed upon. I'm, I'm, I'm gathering that from you. But what, what have you observed? What are some reasons this ends up being very emotional and maybe even controversial? Okay, Zach? Um, you know, it, it seems like it's been a while. I remember when I was a kid, in like the 80s, um, you know, where, you know, I think I know what you mean. It was kind of that just newer, it was kind of like the hymns and the choruses, you mm -hmm. know, it's like the, uh, it revolved around that. And then I remember at one point we uh, brought in drums to our church. It was like a huge deal. Like, Drum, um, drums are a big Yeah, change. I mean, it was like we had to like put like a glass case around them and it was just a lot of people were upset. So, yeah. you know, and, and I remember hearing remarks like, you know, this kind of music isn't in the godly or isn't, mm -hmm. you know, to God because it wasn't the, the hymns that had been sung for mm -hmm. many, many years. So. so Zach, do you, as you look back on uh, the uh, disagreement, would you say it was more what people were used to and then you made change and it's hard for people to adapt to change? Um, yeah, I mean, I don't know if, if the people that were making those sorts of remarks would have stated it that way, but yeah, I think, you know, looking back now, I think that was a big part of it. You know, people were just used to piano and organ for so mm -hmm. long and all of a sudden you've got you know guitar and drums and mm -hmm. it's just that people can't imagine Christian songs being sung that way in a church you know mm -hmm. it's mm -hmm. like a concert or something whereas now in many churches most churches it would be just a the norm it would be the norm to not even use an organ or piano and if it is a piano it might be a synthesizer that's a part of a of a praise band or something like that any other, any, any other thoughts on things that you observe as to why this creates for some people or has created, and I'm, I'm not just looking at our immediate situation, but back over a period of years in churches. Okay, Franklin? Bill, I'm kind of a new Christian. I, I just have that. I can read that in 2006. Okay. But my church back in China is very different than up here. I saw the canes, I have very few instruments, Sometimes piano, sometimes not. And I've been leading worship back in China. And when I came here, I first heard the drum. I was like, what's going on here? Okay. But I'm, as, I just started to learn how to draw me in this, in this semester. So it's a big change for me. My understanding is music um, relates to us in a very deep level, like emotional. Okay. Uh, the love of God is very abstract. <coughs> Usually what we mean is we feel the love of God. We attach the love of God to a certain experience we experience. So when I first, my, after my conversion, the music that I received, I perceived this is how I feel the love of 
Mm -hmm. So it's very strong, it's very deep. Mm -hmm. So when I encounter a new style of worship, and uh, I have to attach my understanding of the love of, uh, of God in this context, it's really hard. And mm -hmm. I interpret it uh, in a different way. So I guess it's, uh, it's something that really can stir our souls when mm -hmm. we came to this aspect, especially we're so accustomed to experience God in a certain way. And then we, so I guess that's one of the reasons mm -hmm. that it's just uh, so emotionally and it, because emotion is something that we don't really perceive. It's mm -hmm. just we just, uh, you know, it doesn't really go through the mm -hmm. brain that we understand, we just, uh, when, you mm -hmm. know, I'm hungry, so, yeah. so I guess Oop. that's how. You're right, we don't always perceive when emotions are, are moving us to uh, make, uh, you know, to see differences, but when there is change, yeah. then we are, there's an, emission, an, an emotional disconnect somehow. Yes. Uh, so Zach's pointed out that the idea of change is, a, is difficult for people, and, and Franklin's mentioning that it's the nature of music itself, worship connected with the music, that gives us an emotional attachment. You've, you've pointed out something, and I don't know if you've read this or this was your own experience, but the music that was present when you came to know the Lord yeah. is going to, re the rest of your life, be the most meaningful music for you. Uh, now, I know that that's an overstatement, and I know that many of us can adapt and learn to love different kinds of music, but that music, when you first came to know the Lord, or may maybe a better way to put it, when you first had your your most positive experiences in a church setting. It could have been when you came to know the Lord. It could have been when you found a church that you just really loved. But that experience of music is going to be a subconsciously a standard for you because you're emotionally connected to it. And when change happens, you are going to feel as though the church is leaving you behind or those younger um, generations are leaving you behind. There's going to be this feeling of abandonment in some ways. And many of you in your church experiences have not seen that drastic change, but those of us who have know that it is ex can be extremely volatile. There can be people very angry about that kind of a change. Uh, the change in styles of music, the change in instruments, um, just the, change, the changes that we go about worship. What else, what else have you, any of you observed in your experiences or, or things that you feel might be brought into the discussion here about music? Okay, Howard? Um, sometimes it can seem like we're copying the world. Okay. Um, we have a praise leader that, that makes an Eminem song with uh, a praise song. It's kind of it's sort of weird to have a <laughs> rap beat with uh, yeah. I will worship. But yeah. Excellent observation, which I would say applies to almost every change of music in churches. There will be some people who are, will perceive that we are no longer we are no longer uh, doing things on a spiritual level, but we're just trying to copy the world out there. The progressiveness, um, in my experiences, this is where drums were controversial, because drums had never been used in church settings before. They obviously had been used in different orchestras and bands and all kinds of other music outside of the church. But bringing them into the church, well, that was the devil's beat. I mean, I, I don't know that I ever knew when someone who would have said that, but it was, you know, all kinds of accusations about drums com communicate something sensual, and to bring this in is just bringing in the world in a wholesale way into the church. So that, that's a great observation as to why it isn't just the emotional attachment but it is the perceived worldliness of some of the change um, that is going on there. Any, any, other, any other comments in some of your experiences with, with music? Caitlin, I don't want to put you on the spot, but you raised your hand that you did have some church experience with it. What, what was that like? Like they like the teaching, they don't like the teaching, and in Nashville it was much more like 
worship focused, we like to worship. So I was just thinking that for a lot of people, um, it wasn't just we don't like the worship, we don't like the change or whatnot. Mm-hmm. It like if they didn't like the worship, it meant I was leaving the church. But there was just a lot more mm-hmm. charge to that decision, and mm-hmm. so I just saw a lot of people leaving mm-hmm. based on the way that people worship. So then it's not just compromising the way that you experience God in music. It's you just lost your mm-hmm. family. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, and you know, Nashville, I've always understood Nashville not only to be the country music center of our country, but also Christian music center. I mean, Nashville is really known for producing a lot of Christ- Christian music, so I'm cer- certain there would be a lot of opinionated people <laughs> in Nashville about, about music and about changes in music. Um, I'm a bit older than all of you in this room. Let me tell you a couple war stories. Um, in fact, before I tell you a war story, I've got to show you one of my favorite cartoons. Um, this guy rolling up his sleeve, he says, I got that scar from the chairman of the board during the, the, during the second battle of guitars in the sanctuary back in 1971. <laughs> the reason that, that cartoon is funny for me is almost exactly that year, uh, well, a little bit before actually, 69 and 70, I was in college. And I was um, in, very active with Campus Crusade for Christ, if you know that organization. And uh, we, we were in the years with Campus Crusade where um, folk music was being introduced as a way to um, bring worship into churches and especially was being introduced for use in evangelism. You know what I mean by folk music. Uh, Paul Simon, Peter, Paul, and Mary, way back, this goes, this way before most of your times, but totally use of guitars, probably uh, electric bass, uh, drums, uh, different instruments than most churches were using in those days. Usually you would have your piano and organ would be the accompanying instruments. So we, we, that is a group of us within our college group, Campus Crusade group on, in the college campus, we formed a singing group, uh, both instruments and singing. And uh, we did it for ministry and we went about to different churches and we totally did an evangelistic kind of thing where people in the church were uh, encouraged to invite younger people, especially college age and others that would relate to us. And uh, this was not done in a Sunday morning. You could never get away with doing this in a Sunday morning, but it was done in a Sunday evening. Usually the church might have had a Sunday evening service, even if they didn't. We would do a concert. And the concert was involving a lot of good music. It was music that a lot of people would know. So there was a lot of singing along. But a part of that was giving our testimony uh, actually the sharing of the gospel because we believe that a number of the people there were, uh, were not Christians, were unbelievers. And it was a great experience. I look back on it, uh, that group of people, there were about eight of us all together, really bonded together and had a real ministry. We eventually, were, we were on the road every week. We were going somewhere every Sunday, sometimes even other nights of the week uh, to, with this, this singing group. But uh, this This cartoon reminds me of the fact that when we went into some churches, there were some people there, especially of the older age. I can say that because that's what I am now. Especially of the older age, who would literally get up and walk out. And um, we would hear later that there was all kinds of controversy stirred up by what we did. By this, this singing group who came, brought drums in, uh, guitars, and in, in, in that day, guitars weren't even used uh, much at all in, in church services. So I had that experience coming out of college and uh, then basically went back to a very traditional church experience for a few years. And then I, I moved from Dallas, Texas, out here to California. This was actually what brought us here. And before I started teaching here at Biola and Talbot, I was um, senior pastor at a church called Community Baptist Church in Manhattan Beach. Now the church still exists, if you know that area of town, it's now called Journey of Faith is the name of the church now, but um, it was a, uh, an old Baptist church 
about 85 years old when I became pastor there. And I was the youngest pastor who had ever served on, uh, in, the, in, in the pastorate on that, in that particular church. I was 37 years old when I started there. I think the youngest pastor prior to me had been about 55 years old. And the man just before me who was retiring was 67 years old. And so you can imagine, quite a shock just to see this young whippersnapper guy coming in. And, um, and then, um, as I got to know the people and as I got to know the leaders of the church over, this took a, about a year, I began to realize something that was really missing in our church. And, and it was very simple. This was a church who had a great missions emphasis around the world. I don't think I've ever served in a church that had a, a, a bigger world missions program. They were so good at this that they were raising up their own missionaries right within their church. And so, and this is a good problem to have, but literally our, our missions board, which by the way was a huge part of our budget, we gave a lot of money to world missions. Every year, we would have to say to visiting missionaries who were coming to candidate, trying to raise their support, we would have to say, you know what? We really are behind your work, but we have so many young people who have grown up in this church and who are getting married and, and, and some of them are going as singles and they're going to the mission field. We have so many of them that we have to give all our money to them. It was a, it was a problem, but it was a good problem. Now, on the other side of, of that discussion was our outreach to our local community. We were reaching people around the world for Christ, but we weren't reaching people across the street from us. It was, I, I would describe it like this, it was an old Baptist church in a beach community that just had no idea of how, of how the neighborhood had changed around them. And um, another church that was not that far away from us were doing a much better job at reaching the beach community. And if you know any, uh, any of the Hope Chapels, the original Hope Chapel was not that far away from us. Very much like uh, Calvary churches and other churches in those days, but it was, it was really doing an effective job. And so we brainstormed among the leadership and also among our, our pastoral staff, all of whom, by the way, were either my age or younger and came up with the realization that we've got to do something about the music. Our music is not connecting with people when they're invited to our church. The, the only, inst well, no, I shouldn't say the only, but the two instruments that were used were the piano and organ in the church at that time. So I took our church through a, a two-year change process, and it was done, different churches choose to do it different ways, but we basically created an alternate service for people who preferred a different style of music and put together a praise band. It would be like the praise band you probably have in your church now. And uh, we used drums and guitars and electric guitar, electric bass, and um, just the whole kind of thing that we did. But I have to look back on those experiences and say, I, I don't think I had as much agony in my whole life as those two years of trying to turn, and the way my fellow pastor at that time did, if any of you had Joe Hellerman for any classes here, he's in the New Testament department. Joe Hellerman was my associate pastor, so we were in this together. And uh, I don't think either of us had so many headaches and so many problems as we did during those two years to watch this church change. Um, Joe says, he said, what you were doing is turning an ocean liner. <laughs> And it was really true. You can't turn an ocean liner on a dime. You cannot make this happen quickly. It has to be a process, just a gradual process. And what I learned over that experience is that music and worship music especially is very emotional. And especially people, all of us will connect with the music that was present when we were first having our earliest Christian experiences and then as change comes about, um, if you're a normal human being, it is very difficult for you to accept change. You know what I discovered also is we created this, I don't like the word now, but at that time we called it a contemporary worship service. That word is a kind of an undefined word. 
contemporary worship service. And um, what I learned once we had a big group, there's a large group started going to this service. Um, once we had a pattern established in that service, there were some things about it that we didn't think were very effective, and so we started to try to change things. Do you know I had just as much flack, I had just as much argument from the t teenagers and 20-year-olds when I started to tamper with their new service. So what I learned from that is we're all very emotionally connected to certain kinds of music. It does go into our soul. I think, Franklin, you're absolutely right there. It's an intangible that moves us and affects us. But that change is hard for everyone. And if you, for one reason or another, were to try to come into your church the way it presently exists and tamper very much with the music and change it for one reason or another, you would have great resistance to it as well. It, it is just something very emotional and very powerful. What I find ironic is, if we could jump to the subject of the Psalms, is the newer music back in the 70s and 80s was actually bringing scripture much more into the lyrics of the music than some of the former music had. Now don't get me wrong, I, I grew up with and I love traditional hymns of the faith. I think the theology in many of those hymns is, real, is, is missed today. It's greatly missed. I, I like a worship leader today somehow who can take the words and the lyrics, I'm, take, I'm sorry, take the words of the um, hymns of the faith that are really good theology and perhaps put new music and new instrumentation to it. I think that's a great compromise to bring those two together. But um, what, I, what, I, what I did uh, discover as time went along is that, is that the, the newer music at that time was actually bringing scripture much more into worship, and I love that. I also would comment that um, music that has been happening in the last 10 years, uh, some of the songwriters, the Christian songwriters who are producing new music, I'm seeing some of the best, our, our, our church uses quite a bit of fairly up-to-date music uh, that you might listen to the radio that week and then that song will appear in church. I think some of the best theology that has ever been put into worship music is coming out right now, to be honest with you. I think some of the songwriters are really biblically grounded and they are producing some great lyrics. I also think some music that has a good sound to it is rotten theology. It is really um, shallow. And in case you're wondering my opinion on this, I also said the same thing about the hymns. There were hymns that were really strong in their message and really clear, and then there are others that were just, just very, very weak. They were very shallow in, in the kinds of things. Now, I'm not saying that there's not a place for all those types of music. What I am saying is I think the key thing in music, I'm sorry, let me go back. The key thing in worship is the, is the words of it. Um, the, the accompanying music is a negotiable, and it's going to change from generation to generation. Did you ever wonder why it is that we have preserved for us the words of Israel's music, but we have no idea what the accompanying <coughs> Um, score the the uh, we, we have a few representation or a few mentioning uh, in the psalms of the instruments, which by the way are very much like some of the uh, more contemporary instruments. The lyre is one of those mentioned. It, it was as closest thing to a lyre today is a um, twelve string guitar. That would be about as close as you could get to a lyre. The drums are mentioned. The trumpets are mentioned. I love in worship in churches when you use full orchestras or something, because I think we're a lot closer to some of the descriptions that we have in the Psalms. But isn't it interesting? We have no idea about the style of, of the music itself, of the score of the music, um, the rhythm of the music. We have no idea what that was like. Well, all we have pres preserved for us are the words. And I think there's a message in in that, in that the words are the most important. They're going to convey good theology, bring us closer to God. The music, though, has this great emotional connection. 
with us. Whatever generation we happen to be, we're going to connect with different, different kinds of music. Are any of you worship leaders in a church setting? Um, Yuri, do you lead? Do you play an instrument? Keyboard. Okay, so you're a part of a praise band in your church. Is that the only style of music that there is with your, your group, and has it always been that way since you've been there? Okay, so there's different styles among the different teams of worship leaders. Okay, good. Yeah, Franklin, how about you? Um, my congregation right now, the average age is 58. Okay. <laughs> Okay, so you offer two different styles of yeah. music, worship. Yeah, I'm trying to adapt him to the drumming and everything, so that's why I started learning how to drum. Okay. I get so bad, like, it's like a younger generation, yeah. more related to that. You're an interesting guy because you have actually had more exposure to the older end yeah. of the spectrum yes. after you became a Christian. Yes. And, and, and now we're adapting yourself to the under, younger end. Usually it's the opposite. Right. That's great. Well, um, let, let's go back to talk about this idea of the Psalms then um, and how they have been a part of and continue to be. The continuing is really what we've been talking about right now. They continue to be a part of, of worship. Um, the book of Psalms has actually been the hymn book or was the hymn book is a better way to put it, of ancient Israel as well as the early church. You may not be aware of this, but even the traditional hymns of the faith, um, Great is Thy Faithfulness, um, hymns like that that are familiar to many of us probably, those hymns really did not come about until the Reformation period. So the early church used almost entirely the Psalms as their hymn book. Is right out of the words of Scripture. Now we don't know, we don't know the kind of accompaniment that was used. In many cases, in many cases, uh, it took the form even of chanting. Gregorian chants would be used, but there were instruments obviously used in worship um, a lot, a lot of the time. And um, so, in Israel, in Israel, what we have is is a a collection of worship music. We don't have the musical score to it, we just have the words to it, and that's what we call the Psalms. And that was passed along, and so the early church really adapted the Psalms uh, into their worship, into their music, and it really wasn't until the Reformation period we, that we have a significant producing of, of worship songs that are apart from Scripture. Now, I would claim that many of the traditional hymns Great is thy faithfulness, those types of hymns are great theology, but they're not taken right out of the Psalms, and that, that's the whole point that I'm making, is, um, is as, as Israel worshipped, um, it provided then this great collection of songs. Let me mention here, uh, this will be, if you have your PowerPoint slides, I've added a couple things in here just to the details of this. Um, the temple and the synagogue had the had use of daily readings of the Psalms, and uh, there's actually a list of them that is still available from very early centuries in the synagogue of particular Psalms that were used by the the Levites and by those who were leading in in worship music um, that, that were used on a daily basis. A couple of other categories, the Hallelujah Psalms, sometimes called the Hallel Psalms, are Psalms 113 to 118. These Psalms were used on particular holy days among the people of Israel. Passover, um, Tabernacles, the Feast of Tabernacles, Pentecost. When the Israelites were called back according to the law to come back to Jerusalem to remember these holy days. And the ones I just mentioned are the three each year. 
where they would be coming back. If they were a devout Jew, they would travel long distances to come back to, to Jerusalem. They would, they would use, in the feast days, they would use particular psalms, Psalm 113 to 118, as a part of the liturgy for those, for those uh, holy days, uh, especially Passover, Tabernacles, and Pentecost. Psalm 146 to 150 is another collection of those. And those seem to be kept together when Ezra and others put the Psalms into the five books. I think that was likely the time of Ezra. These were collected together. There were, there were also Psalms of Ascent, and you'll actually find in the superscription of these Psalms, 120 through 134, you'll find it identified as a Psalm of Ascent. Uh, why is it called, called a Psalm of Ascent? Where does that term come from? It would also, by the way, be used in many of the holy days among the Jews. But why is it called a psalm of ascent? Exactly. Exactly. Um, to travel to Jerusalem today really gives you the sense of why this is true, because no matter what road you come in by bus into Jerusalem, you're going to be climbing a very steep hill. Jerusalem is 2,500 feet in elevation, and, and the high, or one of the highest points is this, is this Temple Mount. And this, of course, today looks very different, but in the first century, In the first century, the Temple Mount, uh, in, in the Old Testament, in the first century, the Temple Mount would have been where the temple was located. So Christians, um, and Jews in the Old Testament, and ultimately even Christians after the church had been formed, would be climbing a hill to get to the areas of worship. Now on the southern end of this, right in this area here, are some steps called the Southern Steps of the temple, this would be just an artist's picture of what these te steps might have looked like. And the reason they're so meaningful to go visit today is because this would be one place that you can say that I know Jesus walked here. I know Jesus walked here. Most places that you go in Jerusalem, you're going to find, um, you could say that Jesus walked through these streets. But the uh, destruction level of 70 AD created about, oh, about 20 feet, 20 to 30 feet of rubble over the top of the first century level of Jerusalem. So you're not, not going to often be able to say, but look, if you look at these steps right here, some of them have been uh, reconstructed. Do you see the nicer ones up here? But the ones that are more broken down at the bottom, these would literally be steps where Jesus would have entered the temple, his disciples would have entered the temple. And so as you got to the temple itself, you would climb the steps. And you would go through these gates. The gates have been closed up now for security purposes. But the Hulda gates were the gates in Jesus' day that you entered into the temple courtyard. And, and this is the meaning of the Psalms of Ascent. As pilgrims came from all over the world, they would sing these psalms as they approached the temple, a part of their worship was even uh, on the way there. And so both the, back to the uh, list here, go the other way, both the Hallel Psalms and the Psalms of Ascent were used and written to, for the particular holy days in Israel's worship. And of course then I've already mentioned the daily Psalms would be written uh, for the uh, use on, on other occasions as well. So a rich heritage of worship songs. Israel used them in their settings. We, we don't have any idea of the nature of the music. We can assume, because there probably is a connection, that modern Hebrew Jewish type of music might have been similar to what it would have been in the Old Testament period, but there's no way of knowing that for sure. What we do know is that we have the lyrics of the songs. And that's what's so great about the Bible, is we didn't have to have preserved for us the music itself, the, the uh, score of the music. What we really needed was the lyrics. 
because that was the heart of the worship, and that's what's passed along, along to us. A second distinctive, if you will, or contribution of the Psalms is, is they're, they're very personal and subjective in the way that we can read them. Now, we, we touched on this point a bit earlier when we were talking about um, the kinds of writing techniques that were used in the Psalms. Writing techniques such as metaphors that are, are very emotional or very personal. Uh, poetry is used because it has a nature to it that can be very emotional, even in the way that the poetry is read. And so it speaks to us in a much deeper level. The Psalms speak to us in a deeper level. What's other, another thing very interesting about this personal and subject, subjective nature is more than any other part of Scripture, this, these really are the words of man rather than the words of God. Now, don't get me wrong. I believe the Psalms are the word of God. But if you stop and think about it, much of the rest of Scripture is either thus says the Lord, the quoting of God in the, the law material um, or in other places where God is, God's word is being quoted by a prophet, or it is history that has been written by various historians about the kingdom of God, about the plan of God, and telling us a little bit more about Israel. But in the Psalms, we really have a, a unique kind of literature. This, these are prayers. There are other places where prayers are used in the books of the Bible, but essentially the whole book of Psalms are prayers. And very personal prayers. Um, Subjective in the sense that the writer was in an immediate situation and he is telling us what he is going through in that situation. And this is in part why they, they connect so well uh, with our lives. I want to turn to a few psalms here. Would you turn with me to Psalm 34? Just to illustrate some of the, um, the more personal nature of this. Psalm 34 is identified in the superscription as a Psalm of David. And the wording in, in my Bible for that superscription says, it's a Psalm of David when he changed his behavior before Abimelech so that he drove him out, that is Abimelech drove David out, and he went away. Um, this is found in one of the Philistine, this story is found in one of the Philistine cities. We can read it in the historical accounts of David. And David is in a tough situation. He is among the Philistines. At this moment, they're probably accepting him as an Israelite because he is, they, they likely see him as a mercenary, that he's, he's a, a soldier for hire. And that they, they, he could be useful to the Philistines because, remember, they're in a, in a war against Saul. and they're, they're in a war against the Israelites. But David realizes that with Abimelech, which likely is not a, a name because there's actually a name that appears in the historical account. Abimelech is likely a title here used in Psalms. But what he realizes is that his, his life is in great danger. And somehow he's, he needs to get out of this situation. So you may, may remember the story. He actually f fakes being a madman. Um, and his actions look like somebody who has gone insane. And it actually convinces Abim Abimelech and convinces the Philistines that they can just let him go, get rid of him. I mean, he seems like kind of a dangerous person at that point. And they let him go, and it was David's way of getting away from them, actually, in the story. But we know that in that situation, he was experiencing great fear, and he really didn't know that he, whether he was going to lose his life or not at the hands of the Philistines. So we read in Psalm 34, if that is in fact the background of the psalm. Uh, let me pick just a few verses here. Verse 4, for example, 4 through 7. David says, I sought Yahweh, and he answered me, and he delivered me from all my fears. Those who look to him are radiant, and their faces will never be ashamed. This poor man cried, 
and the Lord answered him and saved him out of all of his troubles. The angel of Yahweh encamps around those who fear him, and he delivers them. And then the skipping down to verse 15, the eyes of Yahweh are toward the righteous, and his ears are toward, those, toward their cry. Verse 18 says, Yahweh is near to the brokenhearted, and he saves the crushed in spirit. Now we can imagine David's fears and his situation, and those words certainly reflect where he was, but let me tell you the story of Ruth Zabo. Uh, Ruth Zabo was a woman, a dear godly woman in the church that I served in Manhattan Beach as pastor. And she actually had been one of the most inspiring women that I had ever known, um, um, partly because from the time that I knew her, she had potential for her cancer to get worse and worse and worse. And in fact, a year or so after I'd been there as, pa as pastor, that's exactly what happened. Ruth's cancer... Um, spread throughout her body, and it especially set in in her liver. And if you know anything about liver cancer from a human point of view, um, there's no hope. And so Ruth went through an extended time, actually it wasn't that long a time, where her family were there holding her up, and she just faded away. And uh, I, I officiated at her funeral, uh, at her memorial service. At her memorial service, I read these very verses out of this psalm. And I read them because Ruth had had enough time to actually plan her own memorial service. She was ready to face death. She knew that evidently God's will was that she was in the midst of all this. But what she wrote down, and her husband shared this all with me as we were planning the service, what she wrote down were the words out of Psalm 34, that during her times of great fear, of the cancer and its spreading, of, of dying, her fear of dying, during those times, Ruth had looked to these verses. And they meant something entirely different than they did to David. Because remember, David's fears are of, of the Philistines. Uh, I sought the Lord and he answered me and he delivered me from all my fears. Um, verse 15, the eyes of the Lord are toward the righteous and his ears toward their cry. The Lord is near to the brokenhearted, verse 18, and he saves the crushed in spirit. Isn't it amazing how someone could have written words about an entirely different situation, and yet today they go on and they speak to us, and they minister to us. And, and I felt very free as a pastor, uh, hoping to represent well Ruth, but I also wanted to represent the scriptures well. I felt very free to say that God used these words to speak to her, that this was the word of God for her. And that's no exaggeration when it comes to the Psalms. The Psalms are written for that purpose. Um, we are not taking them out of context, because remember, even the writers of the Psalms themselves intentionally leave the details out of the Psalm. We find a little bit of detail in this one just by... Um, Coincidence, Psalm 34 tells us what David's situation is. But I think you're aware that most of the Psalms don't have any explanation as to where they come from. But if you were to know the psalmist at that moment, you would know that he was in an immediate situation and he's writing about it. That's what's so, uh, uh, so um, powerful about the Psalms. Uh, they are perhaps the most subjective part of the Word of God that we have. They can be interpreted in many different contexts. But the reason that they work, the reason all this works, is because they're all grounded in, in the same view of God. And it is the same God. David's God is Ruth's God. And, and the same God with the same character who was going to deliver David was going to be, be there as a strength for Ruth at the same time. So understanding a little bit more of what is going on um, and why it is, I know we've joked about this, but why it is that on any given day you can open your Bible to the middle and close your eyes. In the middle of your Bible, you're probably going to find the Psalms, and you're probably going to point to a page where that very day something is happening to you that relates to that page. That is not by accident. These 
psalms are so relevant and, and personal and subjective in our, in our experiences. Well, this, this one really briefly. Um, perhaps more than any other, we see in the psalms the concentrated use of those elements uh, that, we re, that we talked about earlier. Figurative language, uh, imagery. I would add some of the most beautiful poetry is found in that, that body of literature called the Psalms. All of those together, all of those tools that we've been talking about are going to uh, help us to connect with these. There's an emotional attachment that comes through the use of that kind of language. Uh, God can speak to us through narrative. God can speak to us through prophetic literature, but he's going to speak to us in different ways, whereas the Psalms will speak to us communicating feeling, communicating response to God, and that's why they're so, they're so life-connected. So it's not, it's not by accident that in this part of Scripture we find the most concentrated use of, um, of the techniques of figurative language and images and poetry. It very much connects with the nature of the Psalms themselves. Biola University offers a variety of biblically-centered degree programs, ranging from business to ministry to the arts and sciences. Visit biola.edu to find out how Biola could make a difference in your life.